announcing episode four of the Healthy School Meals for All podcast, which is brought to you by the New York School Nutrition Association. This episode is hosted by Naeem Walcott, West Hampton Beach's School Nutrition Director and President of the New York School Nutrition Association. On this episode, Naeem is joined by Marianne Dayton from the Affinity Group and Joe Kilmer from Greater Southern Tier BOCES. This episode focuses on the impact of Healthy Meals for All and Community Eligibility Provisions, also known as CEP. Marianne Dayton, representing the industry side, explains the challenges faced by manufacturers in producing products due to fluctuating student numbers, and Joe Kilmer discusses how CEP increased his participation by about 20%, allowing for better resources and improved meal options in schools. Welcome back to our podcast series for New York State School Nutrition Association titled Healthy School Meals for All. Uh, with us today, I've got Marianne Dayton from Affinity Group and the New York State uh, School Nutrition Association's Business Advisory Board Chairperson. Industry. Industry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I also have uh, Joe Kilmer uh, from Greater Southern Tier BOCES, Director and the New York State School Nutrition uh, Secretary Treasurer. So welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yeah, we're talking about universal meals. We're talking about CEP throughout this series. Uh, just right off the bat, tell me a little bit about where you are, what you're doing, and some of the impact you've seen with universal meals from last year or CEP programs uh, and how they affect your different areas. So on the industry side, we are much better able to produce products if we know how many students we're feeding. Mm. So when we had the waivers in for uh, the pandemic, it, it allowed us to kind of know that everybody was going to be fed. We weren't going to feed every child, but we knew a better number. Mm. When, we, why, uh, when the waivers expired and we went back to the offer versus serve and reimbursable meals, the uh, we really don't have an idea of the students coming through the lines. And that affects our manufacturers greatly because we don't know if we need 10,000 cases of something or 20,000 cases of a product. And all the line time in the manufacturing plants is scheduled. So we do lose line time not really knowing what we need to produce. That's a really good point. So when we're talking about the manufacturers being able to ramp up or ramp down, mm -hmm. When we don't know the number, how does that impact the school district or an ordering process for uh, the menus for the children? You know, Joe, from your experience. Yeah, so just to build on that, we've taken a number of schools CEP over the years, and we generally see about 20% increase in participation. And that's significant because it brings, you know, more resources, higher volume, um, and, and we're able to re achieve a better reimbursement rate usually. And that gets put back into the program through, you know, better options, better food, uh, keeping equipment up to date and things of that nature. So it really helps to make our programs sustainable and, you know, having suppliers that support you to make nutritional foods. Um, we have to have enough volume to make it interesting True. for them, uh, you know, because we, they're not able to do all these little one off things and, and cater to a small group in today's day and age. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Go yeah, our ingredients are very different for school nutrition. So when a manufacturer produces a product on the commercial side um, for the grocery chain or a restaurant, it could be a very similar product, except our nutritional requirements are much, much different. And any little tweak that you need to make to any product, making it a whole grain product, making reduced sodium, reduced fat, changes everything on that production line. No, that's a really good point. Um, and I know that might be in a more of an expanded conversation, mm -hmm. but I think it's worth saying when we're talking about school nutrition, which is what we're talking about, talking about school nutrition, the product manufacturers, the, mm -hmm. so let's take a, something like a chicken patty. Mm -hmm. Chicken patty that's made for a school nutrition program is very different than a chicken patty you would find at a McDonald's or at a store. Correct. They might look the same, mm -hmm. but they're not the same thing. Right. Speak a little bit more about that, because I, I don't know if people are un mm. under, quite understanding. A lot of times people are like, oh, you're giving them chicken nuggets. It's like, well, they are, but they're not exactly what you're thinking they are. Right. So what we want to do on the manufacturing plant is uh, produce a like product so it has that student accept uh, acceptability mm -hmm. um, on, uh, in, on the lunch program or the breakfast program. However, with our strict government guidelines, 
we have to then use whole grain flour, whole grain breading, uh, reduce the sodium, um, reduce the fat, um, in breakfast cereals, reduce the sugar. So we, we definitely want to make a nutritious product uh, acceptable to the students, but at the same time work within the parameters of the government regulations. And so if I might pick your brain on that, mm -hmm. the healthier we make a chicken nugget, so like over the different years, and I know that sounds really simple like a chicken nugget, but Joe, you'll be able to expand on this a little bit more. We saw the trend going from machine processed, stripped apart meat to whole muscle. Whole muscle, And right. then it was whole grain, mm -hmm. right? And now we're going whole grain, whole muscle, reduced sodium. So Joe, I mean, for, as a purchaser, what's the difference in the intake? Like how does that, it, how, on the numbers? Well, yeah, the, I, I will say that um, previous to CEP, you know, your kids are sending in a dollar, two dollars. Um, you know, our area had pretty low lunch prices and you get a small subsidy from the government. It made the budget harder. So you weren't able to buy as high quality proteins. Now that we've had this extra reimbursement, we put it right back into, you know, whole muscle meat. Um, it's just like the New York 30 where, you know, you get more uh, resources and you're able to put them back into making a better program for the kids. Um, and what Marianne said, you know, making things approachable, you know, food doesn't live in a bubble. Food is a reflection of the society and, you know, the communities that we all live in. So we need to make food that represents that community and what they're experiencing at home, what they're experiencing in the, um, the commercial market through restaurants. We want to bring that in mm -hmm. and, uh, make it healthy. Um, make it approachable and then hopefully they're going to hit the garden bar and they're going to hit vegetables and and get those local fruits and vegetables to to eat along with that whole muscle chicken yeah and i'm very proud of what industry has done because like you said uh just a moment ago you know we are not doing chopped and formed and slurries and we are bringing whole food uh real food into the cafeteria and just making sure that we can mirror to the best possible that we can in the price point that we need to make from both inside and outside. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point when it comes to industry, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times there's a, there's a perception out there of almost like an us and them. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is that it's symbiotic. And when we're saying that we're, there's a call for more scratch cooking, whole foods, whole grain, most like all of these different criteria that we're saying, this is what we want to serve our children. Industry has had to, not, not had to, but has decided, no, we're, we're gonna jump into the fray with you. Mm -hmm. What's that look like though? So for example, if we change the guidelines, like USDA has, has some guidelines that are changing mm -hmm. right now, what's the lead time on something like that? Well, lead time for renovation of products can be uh, at the shortest period of time, about 18 months, and it can be up to three years. Um, it depends um, on the product, on the plant, on the R&D division of that company. Are they uh, a smaller regional company or a national large company? Um, because again, we can't forget that majority of the products that we do create aren't sold anywhere except our K-12 segment. Um, so renovation does take a long time and it is the reason why we attend all the conferences and have a seat at the table, uh, both SNA, ACTA, all of the conferences on the manufacturing side, because we have to hear what the USDA is saying, but we also have to give our feedback to the USDA about really what the realistic time frame is to renovate a product or create a new product. So when it comes to that, just talking about the products, and I wanna get back to just the universal mm -hmm. meals part of it. Joe, what would you say is the biggest aspect of that when we're talking about feeding all kids at no charge so for example you're coming from a school district the BOCE system if you will which is a group of schools that you had some schools that were getting community eligibility provision where some kids were getting meals at no cost and now you had other schools that were doing the application process yeah um, I mean one of the best ways to communicate it is about real life stories from from families that we serve and I'll never forget after the pandemic, we went back to uh, applications and, you know, food inflation has been uh, incredible over the past couple of years. And we had a, a very distraught mother call and um, wanted to know why the district next door was getting free meals still. And then, you know, had heard that they'd had free meals all along. 
Um, and, and her words were, if I would have known this, I would have moved a long time ago um, because it is that big of a strain on that family who's just a little bit above where that, that marker was to get it on the, uh, on the application process. You know, people are missing it by $100 a year or something like that, and it's not significant enough to um, totally satisfy the food needs of that family. And, and, and with all the food inflation, it's been pretty, pretty tough on folks. Yeah. You know, it was uh, an interesting thing that we were talking about in the last podcast, just with the income guidelines, so the way that it is as of right now, uh, let's say a family of four is making fifty thousand dollars. Well, fifty thousand dollars upstate New York and is very different than fifty thousand dollars in Western New York. Is very different than fifty thousand dollars in Long Island, New York. So it's not ex exactly an equitable, because it's a word we like to use these days, uh, system. So going forward, what's what's another takeaway? What's another area where you feel that, as an industry person and and you've, you've been on, on, on many mm -hmm. sides of the line, Mary yeah, and yeah. that's why you're an amazing person to have with us here. You have a very large perspective on the, the full picture of what school nutrition is. Um, what's an area here when we're talking about the money and we're talking about the budgets and we're talking about the manufacturers? We have this new thing where CEP has now been extended and opened up in a new way, but there's still gaps. Mm -hmm. What do you see as a way that industry can partner or where, what's a concern that industry has with the nature of school nutrition as it is right now? I would say one of the concerns is, as you said, the pockets. You know, um, I can speak mostly from Long Island. That's where I'm from, uh, born and raised, live there still. You can drive, just like Joe said, a town over, and it's a completely different school district than the town that you live in. And I think the, the, the biggest part of New York State is that we just are higher cost from the rest of the nation. Yeah. So you can't have one price fits all. Nationally, $30,000 is the poverty level. On Long Island, it's $56,000. 20% of the families on Long Island are in poverty. Can you say that again? Because I don't think people... Just, just the just on the Long end, yeah. Island, fifty. Uh, I'm sorry, just on Long Island, twenty percent of the families are in poverty. Um, the national average is six percent. There are thirteen counties nationally that have property taxes ten thousand dollars or or higher. Long Island has both of those counties: wow. Nassau County and Suffolk County. I pay over $14,000 in taxes on my home on Long Island. My mom, where she lived, she was $30,000 in property wow. taxes wow. on Long Island. So when you're paying property taxes, you don't have a good mass transportation system. A car costs $10,000 a year to keep on the road. You know, all of these things are eating into families' budgets. From the industry side, well, from my personal side, we have to feed children. We have to feed children. They cannot learn if they are hungry. And I think that is the greatest part of why I do what I do. Awesome. Because I have a job to do. I have a job that I get paid to do. But the passion for my job comes from feeding children. That's awesome. Joe, you were talking a little bit about uh, just some of the money aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So with universal meals, we're getting a higher reimbursement rate. How does that translate into a program, whether you're an uh, application using program or a CEP program? How, what, what's the difference in the impact of how it's going to actually transition to the kids? Well, I mean, that's, it's very diverse on how that could happen. It's wherever your baseline starting is, is going to um, dictate the gap and the change. Um, you know, in some of the districts that we've been able to take CEP recently, you know, it's translated into more jobs um, we just put in a request for six more positions um, you know we're feeding more more children uh, we're having to buy more equipment and you know we're able to reinvest um, and, and have those things go directly right into to, to the students and benefit the community awesome and Joe that that's the same for industry for industry if we have universal feeding or free meals for all 
that affects not only our regional area for um, our school districts to employ people, but on our manufacturing side, that's employing people nationally. Wow. So that affects other cities. Um, you know, there's plants that are closing in different places. And, you know, when a plant closes, that just decimates a community, yeah. especially if the majority of the families work there. So in, in, in food, you know, we want to keep on producing. We want to keep on producing domestic food. And the, the I don't want to say the unintended consequence, but the unintended benefit is we're employing people across the country. Wow. I like that. The unintended yeah. benefits. Yes. That's, that's going to be a new <laughs> moniker. Uh, the, the NYSNA president, Caitlin Lazarski, brought up the term of community in the last podcast. And you were kind of both kind of touching on it a little bit. But as you're talking, I'm seeing a, a, a larger a larger picture. And obviously, we're talking about our state, but the, the picture has to become more of a national picture. But can you guys expand in your own ways and from your own experience when we're talking about feeding a child? So the, the, we're going to go from the simplest denominator. So we have a director. We have a staff. We're now we have free meals across the board. So that just basically means we're making a little less than $5 per meal. That has to pay for everything. But that meal affects the employment in the plant. It affects the participation in the district. It affects the revenue that comes in. It affects the quality of food. It, it affects the hiring in that community where the school district is. It affects the child and their nutrition and their ability to grow up and, and develop properly because we're giving them two whole nutritious meals a day. Can you explain? You know what else it does? Please, that's what I want. Yeah, <laughs> fire away. What else? Another unintended benefit yeah. is that family at home has that burden yeah. of those meals. So they can take that budget money and put it towards, well, I don't even wanna say take the budget money. They don't have to put that into their budget. Right. So they have those resources to use on heating, electricity, rent, cars, so forth. Lowe's. Correct. Across the board. Correct. Yeah, we're talking about the budget and I wanted to weave in a little bit about our state budget, you know, oh, if it's away. okay. So, uh, I think Thomas and Napoli, our comptroller, said that 2019-20, um, uh, we've seen about a 40% growth in our state budget since then. So now it's around $229 billion. So we only talk about things with billions in New York um, <laughs> as far as our budgets go. And we, um, as, a, as a community, as a state, spend about $80 billion in health, um, various health things, you know, like Medicaid and, mm -hmm. and such. Um, and it, for education, around $44 billion, I believe. So those are two of, they are the two largest single uh, categories. And we happen to be here advocating to support both of them with what we do. We want to provide healthy meals, and we are here supporting education every day. And our ask is, you know, so minimal. It's actually in the millions. Um, it's less than 1% of our state budget. And uh, I think the, the, the reward Sometimes you talk about things in terms of return on investment. The return on investment is really hard to quantify. We've been speaking about different things in the communities and all these different you know, personal stories. But as a percentage, it has to be exceeding 100%, I would assume. And it's going to help to make those two largest categories of spend um, probably uh, more effective, I would think. Mm. You know, for under, under $200 million around is the number that was used before. Yeah, and I think one of the things uh, that, you know, we're talking about New York State is we have to see what some of the other states have done to provide, uh, provide free meals for all. And I think that we're at a breaking point um, fiscally, both uh, nationally and, and locally, that it is the state, you know, the state has to provide because, you know, when we rank uh, countries on um, health, well, that's a good point. education, um, nutrition, um, we're falling behind and the state, we're going to start ranking, well, we are ranking states already on right. nutrition, health, education, and one way to help our state is to, is to feed the kids yeah. and the state has to be in on that. Yeah. Yeah, and we see that we do have partners in the state. So mm -hmm. New York yeah. State uh, yeah. Ag and Market uh, Commissioner Ball, you know, he's he's a big proponent of what we do, and for the local uh, farm uh, mm -hmm. group. Um, and he came out and he was saying, um, you know, we have to stop talking about food insecurity; it's nutrition insecurity. Right. 
And so when we start parsing out on the, the level that it really is, and my simple analogy to this is you go to a doctor and we've all had a thing or where we've been prescribed some pill to take to ingest to help us feel better. Well, how is food any different? As a matter of fact, the food is the best thing that we can be putting mm -hmm. in, our, in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And as we know, school nutrition is probably one of the most highly regulated and monitored feeding programs, I don't know, across the world. So it is a bigger conversation, but we it, it's good to see that we do have advocates. Mm -hmm. um, even with yep. the 135 million that came in to even expand the CEP program, uh, but yeah, there's still more that needs to be done mm -hmm. because there are those that are, are still missing it. We have kids that are in districts that are not able to offer this and yeah. reap the benefits. Yeah, and I, I think that's where the country is going. We have here and here, and it's the middle that's really what we have to worry about falling through the cracks. Yeah. Because those are the ones that, as Joe said, don't necessarily qualify. They could be off by $100 on something uh, as a family income. And those are the, those are the fringe. Um, and, you know, we need to start really focusing on that. Yeah. You know, some of it's also the family structures, right? So mm -hmm. you might have a single parent that isn't able to spend the time or doesn't have the energy or, or I don't know what capital, if you will, mental or free time capital to even focus on these things because they are working two or three different jobs. You know, the family structure, we don't know. And so we're judging them on their family structure. We're judging them basically on their income structure on a, on a blanket slate that's not, it's not the same. It's not equal. It's not equitable. So it's, it's, it's a big, it's a very large issue there. Mm -hmm. So what's an area that you think that we can make an improvement? We talked about the benefits of having the universal meals. What's another thing that we can do to be proponents of that? You're both heavily involved in advocacy with our legislative action, action conferences. Mm -hmm. Any other any other steps that you think we can take or that we should be taking? Well, I, th I think feeding kids generally is really um, a likable topic. There, it does cause a little bit of confusion for me when I hear people not interested in it because I think of, you know, you're, you're spending all this money sending kids to school on a bus, um, spending a significant amount of money on coursework and technology and um, you know, it seems like a real basic building block. And if you just change the word food to pencil and said, well, we're gonna, we're not gonna supply a pencil. If a kid shows up and they don't have a pencil, they're just gonna stare at the wall. Yeah. You know, is that really an effective use? I mean, no, it's not. We, we need to equip the kids with the tools they need to do their job, which is to be, you know, the, the leaders of the future. Um, and food is an essential piece of that. Awesome. Yeah, and I think um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions on where the funding comes from oh, for yeah. our lunch programs. Absolutely, speak um, more on that. I've heard it quite often just in my own community. They're like, well, I pay property taxes. And I'm like, no, we're not funded by your property taxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think I've come across anybody that knew that yeah. in all of these years. Um, that our, our property taxes do not pay for the lunch program yeah. or the breakfast program. So, Joe, you would be good with this one. Yeah. So, for example, with the reimbursement rate, can you parse out, because this is an area, what that number has to go into? Like, what are all the things that chip away at that number? Being mm -hmm. piggybacking what Marianne said, it's not coming from the general fund. It's not coming from your property taxes. Yeah, so the two biggest expenses we have, um, as with any you know service organization, are going to be people. Um, those are usually your number one expense, and that's typically the case with us. So our staff, and um, you know the things we need to recruit and retain staff, like benefits, they are the number one cost. And generally, it's going to be fifty to sixty percent, I would think. Then your food cost is going to be another thirty-five to forty-five percent. At, at and this is numbers where you maybe don't have enough to really meet that with a non-CEP program. When you do get universal meals for all and you start getting the real funding that is necessary to make these programs sustainable, and I, again, these are various Long Island numbers are gonna be different than what I'm mm -hmm. speaking about mm -hmm. since I'm in the southern tier area of upstate or western New York. Um, so you have a little bit left over to provide for equipment. I've seen equipment values uh, go up at least 50% over the last five years. Wow. I mean, they're significant. What ovens we used to purchase now, easily 50% more. Um, 
and I hate to sound like uh, you know your, your grandparents or your, uh -oh. your parents, but they, they just don't make them like they used to. I mean, we, we <laughs> stuff that lasted 30 years doesn't last um, as long, and for whatever reason, we, we need to make sure that we're keeping them in tip-top shape and purchasing stuff that is um, a piece of it. Um, so but most of it is food and people and uh, a little bit of contractual items and software and stuff so we can process things well and, and do our jobs efficiently, efficiently and communicate well. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, it, it's one of those things where if you're not in it and you don't, you're not hearing about it, you, you really have no clue. You're just, you're just going off of the assumptions. And I think a lot of what this type of uh, environment does, especially these partnerships, bringing industry mm -hmm. to the table to say, hey, we're buying from you. Tell us about your experience yep. and getting, uh, you know, people like Commissioner Ball involved and talking to our state legislators, state ed, bring them all to the table, say, hey, listen, we're trying to do this job, which is feeding kids. Like mm -hmm. just as you said too, Joe, like we're just feeding a child. That's what we're trying to do, nourish a child with proper nutrition throughout their day. Yeah, and on the industry industry side, it is the same thing. It's the cost of labor. Mm -hmm. It's the cost of ingredients, ingredient shortages. Um, we, uh, cost of uh, food has gone through the roof. Um, futures on, on, on flowers and oils and grains. And, um, though, and then there's always those anomalies that you're not expecting. Hmm. A, war in Ukraine, yes. uh, where the majority of sunflower oil comes from, um, you know, different, uh, floods, uh, hurricanes, you know, take plants out, uh, plant fires, just when everything seems to be smooth, plant goes on fire, you know? Mm. So it's all of this, and, and, and our manufacturers do a very, very good job at getting back online. Um, I don't know if we want the word in the podcast, but pivoting. <laughs> okay, we're always pivoting, um, just as you are, you right. know. Um, we have had um, shortages of, uh, we might have a um, vat full of juice and not have the lid that goes on it. Right. So, you know, all of those supply chains, um, you know, uh, ports getting busy, uh, cargo ships setting at sea, bringing in uh, packaging. Uh, we, you know, so it, it just becomes this snowball effect. Yeah. New York State Ed uh, gave us uh, in our update yesterday that uh, it looks like the milk carton shortage. I heard that the gable carton. Yeah, we call it, some call it an echo carton. Mm -hmm. We call it a gable top. Yep. Yeah. That that is, uh, they're, they're going to be implementing waivers for mm -hmm. school districts who are not able to come up with a way. With, with shelf stable or, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Come yeah. up with a way of, of serving milk. And so that's shelf stable is a great example. Mm -hmm. If I buy shelf shelf stable milk, it's way more yes, expensive yep. than mm -hmm. the other, you know, carton of milk that I'm getting refrigerated yep. to give to a child. That aseptic packaging is expensive. Exactly. It's yeah. And so, if you don't have the universal meals and you, you're not getting that higher reimbursement rate, you're being put at a, well, I don't want to say at a loss, but you're putting at a disadvantage in feeding the children which essentially means that you're putting those children that you're trying to feed at a nutritional disadvantage because now, guess what? You can't get milk. Yep. We can't afford the aseptic pack, so we're going to do a waiver so that mm -hmm. the program can still operate in some kind of capacity mm -hmm. or that it, so I don't have to lay off staff. And those are terrible decisions when it comes to what our job is, which is feeding children. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things. I mean, everybody um, paves the road with good intentions. You know, we, we do our planning. We... We ask the schools for their forecasting, and and then you just have these wrenches <laughs> <laughs> that come in, and uh, you know you you just I think from the industry side we do the best that we can. Uh, I'll sp speak for all industry partners to communicate those challenges and keep communication open with our school districts, and and you know it's, sometimes you just don't see it coming. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Joe, what about you? What's uh, an area that you feel like we can advance this conversation? Like, who needs to be involved? Well, we have a really broad coalition. I think it's the broadest coalition that we've ever had um, across school administrators and various advocacy uh, organizations against hunger. Um, so I think we just need the final group to come together in Albany or, you know, in a federal level even, 
but in Albany is what we're asking for to take care of that group that's left out. You know, the, the huge mm-hmm. strides we've made in last year, probably one of the greatest strides ever to solving this problem. Um, we're so close. We're so close we can taste it, right? Yeah. Isn't that? <laughs> no fun intended. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Any other final thoughts, guys? What do you got? National meals, universal meals, challenges, ways that this can improve well, benefits. If, if people are still listening at this point, I would say, uh, you know, we need you to advocate. Um, we need we need your stories. You know, we're, we're just uh, three people here chatting. I know there's hundreds and thousands of more stories yeah. that are going to help the folks in Albany do the right thing. And um, having them come out to LAC, participate in our virtual event. This year we're doing a uh, in-person uh, one-day lobby event. And that would be phenomenal. So, so even people who have already felt successful by this latest wave, your stories are so valuable because it, it shows it's working. Yeah. What, Joe, real quick, tell people what LAC is. Uh, Legislative Action Conference. And we typically do that uh, in Albany in January, I believe, um, and virtually. So awesome. Yep, and from the industry side, I mean, I just know all of our partners are here to support it, and uh, if we can get universal meals for all, um, that is definitely going to uh, provide the manufacturers uh, with the volumes to continuously produce K-12 products. Awesome. Well, Marianne Dayton from Affinity Group and Joe Kilmer from Greater Southern Tier Boces, we want to thank you for being part of our podcast. And um, thank you for watching and listening. Thank you, Naeem. Appreciate it.